Sony R Siri, and I am not an engineer art program. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving a talk on three of my projects today, Rev, Redactor, and Rhea. But uh, I kind of decided this naming scheme is a bit redundant. So I am uh, renaming Rev, which is probably one of the least Googleable names ever since I know, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to now call Rev Coolio. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I really love network programming. Uh, pretty much ever since I discovered the internet, like network programming has been my big thing. And uh, I kind of get this idea that most Rubyists view the world this way. You know, they really you know their application, their web framework, and rack. And then below there, everything's a black box. And uh, really quick, I'm curious how true that actually is. So how many of you have really dug into the source of any web framework? Ever. All right, pretty much anybody in the room. How about people who've dug into Rack, kind of see what's going on? All right, how many of you have really looked at the source code of any web server really dug into it? Well, quite a few. That's a little bit surprising. How many of you have dug into VM? A bit fewer, but a bit more than I was expecting. And how many of you have really dug into the source of the OS kernel? Yeah, a bit fewer there. <laughs> so, um, you know, I really think there's a life outside of HTTP, and most of the stuff that I was doing prior to web programming was uh, not related to HTTP. So in 2003, I started this project called Distribute Stream, and the idea was it was a uh, bit torrent but better. So I had originally started writing a BitTorrent library in C, you know, I saw that uh, BitTorrent was originally written in Python, and I was being C zealot at the time, and I'm like, Oh, I'll rewrite it in C for speed, and it'll be faster and better. And as I started doing that, I really started noticing all these problems with BitTorrent I thought I could solve better. And I uh, spent about two years trying to develop uh, a replacement protocol to stream stream in C. Uh, learned a lot of stuff about network programming in general, but didn't really make much headway. So in 2005, I had to step back and admit that I'm not really being productive. Uh, I need to learn some new language that's uh, better than C that would make me more productive. And uh, there's this quote, I believe it's by Bill Joy. I've tried to find it uh, again after I first saw it, but I can't. But it goes a little something like, there comes a time in every C programmer's life when they realize that they've debugged enough memory leaks and enough pointer arithmetic errors and written enough linked lists and enough hash tables, and they move on to a language with a higher level of abstraction. So I was checking out a bunch of languages, and uh, I saw Ruby, my roommate at the time was really into Ruby, but you know, I, I was all C's all at four speed, and uh, you know, Ruby had this reputation of being pretty much one of the slowest languages ever. But uh, I heard, you know, I, I was sort of overlooking Ruby for that reason, but I heard about this uh, new VM called Yarv, and, you know, seeing that, I'm like, okay, well, maybe Ruby will be faster soon. And what really sold me on Ruby was Rails. Rails had just come out and uh, started working for a startup company. And they wanted, uh, you know, they wanted to do web programming, and Rails was really good for that. So in 2006, uh, I was working with the senior project team at a local university. And uh, I had them start rewriting the Sturdy Stream in Ruby. So I sort of had this idea that, you know, BitTorrent could be the Python peer to peer protocol and Distribute Stream could be the Ruby one. And I was using Event Machine to handle, uh, you know, planning for massive numbers of connections. And the real uh, idea that separated Distribute Stream from uh, BitTorrent was that. Distribute stream could have this gestalt view of the entire network. It was all centrally managed. And then you could apply collaborative filtering algorithms, something like slip one, to uh, sort of predict what the transfer rates would be between peers if they had never exchanged any data. So at the same time, I'm working with Rails, and uh, we were having a lot of problems, mainly with deployment. So uh, you know, the initial way that you could deploy a Rails app was with CGI. And with CGI, every single request it had to load the entire Rails framework, and that was really slow. And uh, FCGI came out, anybody remember Lighty? 
a few people, wow. Lighty used to kind of be the main way that you were supposed to deploy Rails apps. It was pretty good at the time for FCGI. And uh, this other thing, yes, CGI came out. But what I thought uh, Rails really needed was something like Apache Coyote. Uh, Apache Coyote is an HTTP connector for Java. So it's basically your uh, web app can talk HTTP directly. And I'm sort of old writing that myself, but I didn't have to because this thing called Mongrel came out. And at RubyConf 2006, uh, slept through Evan's keynote. Sorry, Evan, that might have uh, changed some things. <laughs> I actually seen it. Uh, so I was waiting for Matt's to announce that uh, Yard would be coming out that Christmas. I was really expecting it for some reason. Uh, but that didn't happen. There wasn't any Yard. Where is Yard? <laughs> and uh, that made me a sad panda. But uh, there was an open bar at the hotel when I started drinking, and then they had this thing where you could come ask Matt's question. <laughs> I, I got up and kind of ran into Matt's. I'm sorry about that. I was a little bit drunk. But, <laughs> <laughs> but after that, uh, I met this guy. Uh, you, you might remember him at the time he had hair. Uh, that would be Zed Shaw, if you don't recognize him. Uh, you know, I'd seen him earlier that day, and he got up in front of everybody. And he said, I'm Zed Shaw, and I wrote Mongol, and received thunderous applause. So, you know, me, people used to like Zed. <laughs> <laughs> Zed came over to me, he's like, why don't people care more about like speed and performance and stuff like that? Uh, our Rails app is actually going into infinite loops. We just deployed on Mongol. Uh, if you ever install Mongol, you've probably seen this thing called the CGI EOF multi part patch, I believe. And uh, there was this bug where anybody could send a malformer request to your server and put it in your infinite loop. And I started talking to Zed about that. He's like, oh my god, you discovered this crazy security vulnerability we're trying to keep under the wraps for now until we can get a patch out for it. And uh, I was talking to Zed about the sturdy stream and using a vent machine. And he said, you know, vent machine basically sucks. And you should work on his project, which was Ruby Event, which was uh, write a wrapper for Live Event in Ruby, and he had some problems with that, never really got them worked out, never released it. So meanwhile, uh, later at the conference, there was the Denver Accord. I don't know if any of you know about this, but uh, basically Matt and Toyoshi got together that Sunday night and uh, created this new repository for 1.9, sort of freeze commits to the Matt's branch and merge Yarvin to new. I don't know if I was in any way influential with that, but that was a really good thing to see come out of the conference. So 2007, uh, you know, I had this project built on a vent machine. We were having some issues with the vent machine, and I became a committer. Uh, I tried to fix as many of these problems as I could. And basically, the code base is really hard to work with, and uh, I just got really frustrated with it. <laughs> So Rev, actually, I didn't start. It was started by this guy named Frankie Rye and Zed Shaw. Uh, it was to be a Ruby wrapper for the Libby V library, sort of like LibEvent, but maybe a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to use API, that sort of thing. But uh, both of them soon left, and basically before either of them had committed any code at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, really, I, I it's easy to complain about something like a vent machine and how it's written, but I think the best way to complain about stuff, you know, this is great code, is just to try to write something better and see if you can. So uh, Zed and I had kind of been friends, and he wanted a new blog theme, so I introduced him to our designer. Uh, her name's Mar, and she made this, if any of you remember it, uh, the, the Zed so fucking awesome blog theme. And uh, shortly after she made that for him, uh, Zed posted, you know, his blog post I'm sure you all know about. <laughs> but Zed was basically gone, leaving me, like this Frankie guy disappeared. So uh, basically I was the only one left here to try to write this new event framework. So that framework is now Coolio. You can find it on GitHub there. It's sort of the kind of things you'd use it for, right? If you need to handle a large number of incoming connections, there's this whole C10K thing you might have heard about, like how can you scale to 10,000 plus connections, right? 
But using something like a library like WebEV, you can do that. If you have large amounts of I.O., if your program is really uh, I.O. bound primarily, doesn't use a lot of CPU, then you know, this is something you can really look at. And the other thing that this is really good for is shared state between connections. The, you know, when you have shared state and you're using threads, you have to synchronize it. It's hard. The concurrency is hard. And this lets you uh, sort of eliminate the concurrency and do everything with callbacks. So what sort of things would you actually write with this? Uh, Web Spiders is a big one. Uh, after DistribuStream, the next thing I used it for was my company wanted Web Spiders. So I used Rev to build a massively concurrent Web Spider. Uh, HTTP push servers maintain persistent connections. So again, it's going back to that massive numbers of connections thing. And chat servers like I am, you know, that sort of thing. That's a good shared state problem where you're trying to take some state and deliver it to all the other connections. So Rev supported platforms. It works on uh, MRI 1.8.6 plus. It also works on YARV. And uh, now I finally got it working on Rubinius Head after uh, some changes I made and some changes you made there. So uh, here's a quick crash course on invented programming. So normally when you're uh, trying to get stuff off the network, you just call a method and give it some params and get a response. With invented programming, instead of doing that, you use these callbacks. So if something's successful, you have a non-success callback. If something fails, you have a non-failure callback. Another way to do this is with a block. So you can start your request and you get this response object back and you can look at that and go, was your request successful or not? So event machine kind of reinvents the whole IO layer. So event machine was sort of originally conceived to be something like live event, like a multi-language uh, event library binding. And uh, it kind of didn't succeed at that. For some reason, it only succeeded in the Ruby community. Uh, and basically, it reinvents a little IO layer. Uh, I built Coolio with the Ruby primitives. So all the sockets that he uses, all the IO objects come straight from Ruby. Uh, the SSL stuff also comes straight from Ruby. So there's really two things you need to know about Coolio. You have the uh, event loop object, and this is the only thing in the entire library that ever blocks. And then you have these event listener objects that you attach to that, and those are all non-blocking. So here's some quick example code. Uh, here you have, this is your basic echo server. You have a uh, connection class that has these three callbacks here. When something connects to it, when something closes from it, or when something reads from it. And it's really simple there. Whenever you read something, you just write it back out, right? And then down there at the bottom, you see it uh, you're creating the TCP server. You give it that connection class, and then uh, you attach that to the event loop and run the event loop. And that will just sit there and block receiving incoming connections. For doing HTTP, you have uh, quite a few more callbacks. So this exposes a lot of the events that can occur throughout the uh, HTTP request lifecycle there. So uh, this basically will connect to a web server, make it get request, and print out the results. Uh, it's also got file system monitoring. Anyone ever heard of Watcher? Yeah. A few people. Yeah, cool. Uh, Watcher is built on Rev and uh, uses it for uh, file system monitoring. So uh, this guy named uh, Ryan Dahl contacted me after writing this web server called Ebb. He wanted to support using Rev side by side with Ebb. Uh, Ebb was based on LibEV as well, so it seemed like a really good fit. And uh, right, uh, originally when I had uh, backport, I wrote uh, Rev originally for 1.9 and backported it to 1.8. And Riot actually found some really nifty tricks for uh, interfacing with 1.8 scheduler, and I adopted those into Rev at the time. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Riot kind of gave up on Ebb, it never really got popular, but he took the ideas of having a LibEV backend and created Node.js out of that. So uh, some next steps that I'd like to happen to Coolio, uh, asynchronous file I.O. So if you've ever used Node, everything is asynchronous, and uh, 
to accomplish that, there's sort of this companion library by the author of LibyDB called LibyIO that puts all these blocking requests into a thread pool so they can be asynchronous too. And then uh, Roger Pack has offered a $50 bounty to anybody who will swap out the LibyDB backend and switch it to LibEvent. Uh, LibEvent just has better support on Windows. So uh, then I discovered Erlang. This book came out here and uh, I read it and I thought Erlang was really awesome. I have a uh, quick video to play for you here. Uh, it's kind of loud, so please cover your ears if you don't like loud noises. Hey, do you want to feel so parallel? Erlang! Programming languages for people who need gratuitous amounts of parallelism. It's like hyperlang. It's like adding parallelism to a pure Euclidean space. Sound the alarm, you're gonna be uncomfortably parallel! What's that? You want databases? Well, how about databases? <laughs> Who do you like me? Databases! <laughs> You'll be good at them! It's a functional language for men! Functional! <laughs> These are parallel puns! P map puns! Functional parallel puns! Functional parallel maps, P maps, R maps, R maps, and you're the one cat! That's room four! You'll be so fast that Google be like, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Parallel ports. So much parallelism. Yours. It's computing all the time. <laughs> Parallel attic, parallel index, parallel search, parallel colony, parallel aggregate, parallel crash. Why children? <laughs> so many children. 4,096 children. <laughs> Hyperlink your children and they'll be good at databases. <laughs> run abnormally fast.
create a listener socket, you have a loop that listens for incoming connections, and then it creates a, in this case, actor, which is your concurrency primitive that sits there and uh, listens for you, listens for the client to write stuff and just writes back out to the socket. So since uh, Ruby has seemed to love web apps a lot, uh, you can write asynchronous web applications using this web server called Rainbows. And Rainbows is the unicorn web server modified for uh, asynchronous uh, request processing. And Unicorn, if you know, it will automatically spin up one VM per CPU core. So if you want to have a single web server that takes advantage of all your CPU cores and lets you do event-driven programming, you can use Rainbows. And uh, here's some quick examples. I really love the uh, uh, Rainbow's Bing function. <laughs> it's uh, pretty neat, but uh, I don't really know how to use Rainbow's. I never really tried it. But uh, if you're interested in doing uh, web programming with this, take a look at Rainbow's. So, uh, any a volunteer from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Imitators, all right. Come on. <laughs> so, we're going to do some live action role playing of the actor model. So come up here on stage. All right, I have a couple messages here. Uh, this one is a ray, and this one's a hash. So I'll give it to you. So I'm going to be off doing something, but uh, come and put the, uh, put the uh, array in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm up here speaking. I'm up here doing my thing. But OK, now I'm ready. And I'm going to look in my pocket for a hash. And all I have is this list. So now I'm blocked. I can't do anything. So come put the uh, hash in my pocket. <laughs> and, oh, now, that, uh, now that I got a hash, now I'm unblocked. But this list is back in my pocket, so I can come and do my thing until I do care about a list and know there it is. So uh, that is my attempt at doing live action role playing in the after all in my show. So I'd love to you continue talking about Revactor, but I'd really like to get on the radio. So if you want to know more about actors and Revactor in general, well, there's a website for it. So you know, I really became disenchanted with this whole idea of uh, faking synchronous I.O. on top of fibers. And uh, I have another little video to share with you here to explain that. Are any obvious disadvantages to patching a blocking library to use fibers at the socket level? It's far too much effort to have to rewrite large chunks of every library just to make it a sync and fiber aware. Just use threads. Not gonna happen. Even if this was a personal project, I won't use threads, so I guess they'll just have to continue rewriting parts of a bunch of libraries as I go. Oh, wait. I remember who you are. You're the omniscient guy who needs Rockful scale, and you think threads are going to stop you from servicing your Rockful millions of users. And I remember that you hate fibers for whatever reasons. I don't hate fibers. I just think a lot of people are misusing them for silly things. My boss wants a highly scalable async platform backend, and from experience, I'd rather wrap the async code in fibers than have tons of callbacks to get it. What scale are you really talking about? Because last time you just started blurting the word cloud at me, like it meant something special. Recently large scale, obviously not right from the beginning, but as functionality and the client base grows, it needs to scale up majorly, with interfaces to pretty much every large social media related sites on the web. Do you have any actual numbers, or is Rockful Scale really the best description of your capacity plan? I can't talk numbers. The platform is still in early development stages, but it needs to be able to make many hundreds of requests in real time. You don't know what the numbers are, and yet you're saying hundreds of requests in real time that can work just fine using threads. Okay, let's say thousands of requests in real time for online client and it should give you a rough idea, because it's too early in development to be able to be too specific. That just means you are doing no real projections, which means it's purely technological masturbation, and if there's thousands of requests per client in real time, that's more than likely a completely silly sentiment for the plain and simple reason that a particular user is unlikely to even want to read all the results of thousands of requests each time they visit. I'm not a boss, I just write the code required to make shit happen. For the data fetched over hundreds of thousands of requests will be processed to averages and some statistics. 
you should tell your boss to pay for some consulting from someone that's built these kinds of systems before you're already set in stone that you need raffle scale, which is both architecturally wrong and bad for the business. It's only because you want raffle scale that you seem completely certain that threads are inappropriate for your use cases. You really don't have any idea of the specifics of the system, so you cannot judge what sort of scaling is required. You don't seem to understand what sort of scaling is required either, and you clearly don't understand the difference between threads and fibers in this kind of context. I understand that threads have more overhead than fibers and any shared data would require locking and syncing. Fibers still share state, and if you want key patch network libraries to use fibers it becomes hard to understand when your fibers are yielding, so you still need locking anyway to provide transactional mutations to shared state. Fibers do not run concurrently. That doesn't change the fact that fibers still share state, and by trying to stick a pretend synchronous API on top of things you lose a sense of where context switches are happening, and run afoul of a lot of the problems of threads, which will still scale very well. I don't care. Ruby on Red is already multi-threaded. I don't care. J Ruby and Iron Ruby already support concurrent multi-threading without any sort of global interpreter lock and Rubinius will soon support it too. This means one instance of your application will scale across multiple CPU cores. With a sync programming you need to run a separate virtual machine per CPU core. I don't care. Yet Luna Katz, the fucking core developer of Rails 3, recommends that you use threads. I don't care. The Varnish cache, which is arguably the fastest and best HTTP cache available, uses threads to handle multiple concurrent connections. I don't care. MySQL, which is arguably the most popular open source database in the world, uses threads to handle multiple concurrent connections as well. I don't care. What the fucking fuck? <laughs> I argue with people who think they need raffle scale and that fibers are the only solution. So yeah, that actually isn't a strong man argument there. Are large parts of that are verbatim from a real IRC conversation. <laughs> So, uh, really what it comes down to is a uh, principle of least surprise, right? Like, on Ruby, pretty much the principle of least surprise is not to use evented programming, it's to use threads. And uh, if you want to do evented programming, there is a language where uh, events are the principle of least surprise, and that's JavaScript. And I really respect Node for that. Uh, Node really found, you know, no just combined events in JavaScript in such a great way that it is awesome, I recommend it. So uh, what happened is Erlang kind of fizzled. It's not that it failed per se. There's a lot of really cool projects on Erlang, but all the hype eventually died down. And uh, saw so this really neat passage from the book Coders of Work, which I highly recommend. But uh, that's just some of Joe Armstrong's thoughts on Erlang there. And uh, at the end of that, he said, uh, to make Erlang popular, yeah, Microsoft might stick some curly braces on it. And I'm like, no, I could just use some Ruby syntax. So Zed Shaw, he's really passionate about languages, about getting people to learn how programming languages work and that sort of thing. And uh, Erlang is some really horrible syntax. And what really makes Erlang syntax bad is it's just uh, adding insult to injury in terms of Erlang is just conceptually so different from any, every other language that when you have this like weird prologue syntax, it makes it that much more impenetrable. So I started working on Rhea, and uh, started on it in 2008, and I really wanted to leverage Erlang's strengths. So Erlang's main one is nonstop systems. So uh, you know you might have seen the Erlang claims that it gets 99.999 blah whatever uptime, but really the, the core idea there is that there's no theoretical reason why you should ever need to stop the Erlang VM. And real-time programming together with the non-stop programming, really all the other ideas in Erlang come from these two ideas. So to have a non-stop system, it really needs to be fault tolerant. If you have faults uh, and you don't tolerate them, your system's going to stop. <laughs> Uh, hot code swapping, if you want to make any changes to your code, you've got to be able to do that live and be able to do it transactionally and inside a concurrent environment. And uh, distribution is really the final strength of the program there. 
So I wanted to take Erlang and add Ruby syntax to it. Uh, the other thing about Rhea is it's an immutable state language. And really, uh, when you look at the whole functional language versus uh, imperative language thing, I think the core idea there is really immutable state. That's really the only major difference between those two language families. Uh, I was actually talking to Brian Ford about it has been proven that the continuation passing style of functional languages is equivalent to the SSA uh, model of imperative languages. Uh, here's an obligatory Lady Gaga slide on uh, no, 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 2009. Um, so I presented Rhea at Erlang Factory back in 2009. At the time, I had a mostly working implementation. And the big thing I was excited about was Erlang has this idea uh, called a gen server, where they take the actors of Erlang and wrap them up and make them into something that's almost an object. And uh, so I took that and actually put the sort of Ruby style class syntax onto it. And at the time, it had a web framework called Ryan. Uh, this is what really inspired me to do concurrent objects. I saw this quote from Alan Kay. Uh, and, you know, he, he had this idea of, you know, objects really being these things that are sort of like individual computers, you know, web services or that kind of thing. And they talk to each other with messages. So Node started blowing up in 2009 and uh, really got people interested in event-driven programming. Which I think is neat because uh, Node and Coolio share some of the same technologies, or share these same technologies, although I don't have the Libby and I support yet. But uh, in late 2009, as I was working on Rhea, it was uh, ZOMG too slow. It was really, really slow as I tried to develop a standard library. It just wouldn't work because each file I added would take that much longer to load. And uh, basically, I really didn't know what I was doing the first time I wrote Rhea. So, uh, you know, I, I decided if you fuck up the language. <laughs> 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 so in 2010, I basically completed the Rhea rewrite. It's uh, over 9,000 times faster than that, not literally. Uh, I, I learned really how to write a language on top of your VM by failing the first time. And uh, I really started looking at the Erlang compiler itself to get ideas. So I kind of tried to do everything myself the first time without really looking at their ideas. And uh, definitely that was a bad idea. And the neat thing that came out of this was uh, now everything in Rhea is an object. So uh, originally I didn't have any sort of non-concurrent objects in the language, but what I ended up adding were these uh, immutable objects. So let's take a look and let me see if that will, you know. <laughs> oh, also not on the Wi-Fi there. <laughs> so let's see. So here is the uh, Rhea source tree. I'm going to start this thing called IR. It's just like IRB, it's interactive Rhea. So there it is running on top of the Erlang VM there. Uh, so quick first example, hello world. So if you're in Brian's talk, you like this idea of uh, putting puts on the end of things. And the main reason I do that is Rhea doesn't have a top level scope, mainly because Erlang doesn't have that. So if you wanted to actually do the uh, more Ruby-like way, you'd have to do this. So there's Hello World again. Uh, so Array has this, so, you know, where this would be an Array in Ruby, this is a singly linked list in Array you can call. <coughs> map it on it like that. And uh, I actually made this bang syntax first class here. And what that does is it actually modifies the receiver. So uh, it's a mutable state language, right? Like how can you modify the receiver? But what it's actually doing there is changing the binding. So list is now bound to uh, 
a new version of the list there. And the other neat thing it has is the list comprehensions. If you've ever done a Python, you might have reused list comprehensions in the past. Uh, it also has tuples. Again, this is something you may have used from Python. But uh, those are basically, these are basically the equivalent of arrays as opposed to a single length list. And then another neat thing it has is pattern matching. So you can have these deeply nested structures. It's going to make a fairly shallow one here. So what that's actually done is bound all those variables there. So it has modules, just like Ruby. Going to do def plus two, six n, do n plus two. So modules are just sort of like collections of functions. They're not quite as powerful as they are in Ruby. Do plus two, and get 42 there. So then the other thing is there's no real idea of uh, reopening uh, modules or classes. So I can actually do class adder here. And the reason for that is sort of to get closer to Erlang's uh, hop code swapping semantics. So I, this is declaring a uh, class of immutable objects here. So it did have this little shortcut syntax here, so you can actually find an instance variable directly from uh, initialize there. And I can define a uh, method here. What we've done it would be a variable name there or whatever. So the instantiation syntax, I do want to add dot new. I don't have singleton objects yet, but so for now to instantiate something you have to just sort of do a little more Python style there. You can do adder dot add and get that. Uh, lambdas, you can do so fun actually comes from Erlang, but if you've ever used Erlang, the fun syntax isn't very fun. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done is sort of taken the uh, stabby lambda syntax from Ruby 1.9 and adopted that. So I'll just do n plus 2 there, right? And uh, there's some indecipherable Erlang about where in the code server that function happens to be located. And then the invocation syntax here is just like uh, Python, actually. So you can just call it like that. So getting on to the multi <coughs> concurrency stuff, uh, Erlang calls its actors processes. I'm sort of taking that same name there. What I'm going to do is bind this to uh, PID. And spawn is the uh, method you call to create a new process. So when I reached into my pocket to check for those messages there, what I was doing was this receive thing. And receive sort of works like a case statement, but you don't really do case on anything. You're just kind of doing case on your mailbox. So this is going to wait for a symbol called foo. And uh, when it gets it, it's going to tell you I uh, got a foo. Finish that off there, and that creates a PID. That's just sort of uh, giving you an ID on it there. And then to uh, send that PID asynchronous message, you use the uh, bang uh, operator there. So you go ahead and send it foo. And when I do, it says I got a foo. So uh, that concludes my little quick tour there. Let me see if I can actually get back to Keynote here. It's really quick again. <laughs> What's the uh, the mirroring thing? It's supposed to be command or control option command eight. So uh, I don't know if any of you saw it, but at RailsConf and at OSCON, uh, Ilya Grigor talked about EM synchrony. And uh, you know, I'm not really opposed to EM synchrony. I think it's pretty cool, but EM synchrony basically does uh, the same thing as never block. 
try and mutate fibers and let you do uh, fake synchronous I.O. with them on top of a vent machine. And the thing about it is he really has sort of started popularizing this idea and there's sort of been a debate going ever since. Uh, I think EM synchrony is mainly aimed at raffle scale and he demonstrated things like uh, rails running on top of it. I don't think vented backend is really good for the typical things that Rails apps tend to do. But uh, because it's popular, I sort of dusted off William and Refactor. I try to modernize them. And uh, so if you're interested, check them out. I still like Rhea better. Uh, one of Rhea's biggest drawbacks in recent history is I've done a really bad job of documenting it. But created a new website, sort of inspired by CoffeeScript, and I'm going to load it up with tons and tons of examples. Uh, so one of the neat things that is sort of being worked on right now by a few of the contributors on the project is a peg grammar. Uh, it's available here on GitHub. It's built on top of this, uh, this peg generator for Erlang called Neotome that's sort of like treetop, right? And uh, the peg grammar is being written by these two guys here. And uh, it actually has tests. I don't have any tests on the grammar itself, although I do have a test suite on the language. Uh, some of the neat things that a peg could bring, uh, right now the, the current uh, parser I've written has a lot of trouble handling white space. Uh, removing semicolons from the end of lines is surprisingly hard. <laughs> uh, it supports nested interpolated strings, so while Rhea has interpolated strings, you can't nest them, and with a peg that's pretty easy. And then everybody loves these like slash limited regex literals, but they're actually kind of hard to implement because they're ambiguous with things like uh, divide, for example, and divide equals. So uh, peg can really handle it as well. And one thing I don't have on the slide that might be possible in the future, right now Ray has mandatory parents on everything, but with a peg it might be possible to remove those in certain cases. Some of my next steps for Rhea here, one of the big things I've been working on lately is singleton classes. Uh, as I was saying with .new, I would like for people to be able to call .new just like a Ruby. Uh, I want to get the concurrent objects back. That was something that is sorely needed. Because basically everything in Rhea is either immutable data or a process. Uh, namespaces, we all have namespaces and default and keyword arguments. And finally, I'm going to look at some ways to support metaprogramming. There's no way, no way I can ever come anywhere close to what it really has, but uh, I'd like to support some limited cases of it. So one more thing before I conclude my talk here. Compilers aren't hard. I know a lot of people think they're the, this sort of uh, impenetrable black box, but if you actually take the time and start looking at them and study other compilers, you know, really, I had been afraid of it for a while, but I, as soon as I did it, I discovered it's not that hard at all. So I'd concur encourage you to create your own freaking awesome programming language. There's a book by the same name that I would uh, highly recommend as well. If I can do it, you can too. All right. <laughs>